of the San Francisco Human Rights Commission and the chair of the LGBT Advisory Committee, which is charged with addressing issues of discrimination. Thank you everyone for coming again. My name is Zoe Polk and I am at the San Francisco Human Rights Commission. We know that San Francisco attracts uh, people from all over the world, many of whom are LGBT persons seeking refuge. Um, can San Francisco maintain its LGBT friendly reputation when we are in some ways being unfriendly to our LGBT nonprofits? Uh, many of those nonprofits who were very instrumental in us building this reputation for being LGBT friendly uh, in this city. Uh, so tonight we hope to engage each other on the issue of, of nonprofit displacement. And I'm honored to, that the dialogue will be led by the individuals on this panel, each of whom will uniquely enrich the conversation. So first we will hear from Grant Eshoo. Mr. Eshoo is the program director of the Housing Equality Law Project. Uh, HELP seeks to expand legal protections and fair housing through advocacy, leadership, leadership training, education and outreach, and enforcement of anti-discrimination laws. HELP was located in San Francisco and has now moved, moved to South San Francisco. Uh, next we'll hear from Jody Schwartz, who is the executive director of Lyric. Lyric's mission is to build community and inspire positive social change through education enhancement, career trainings, health promotion, and leadership development with lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and questioning youth, their families, and allies of all races, classes, genders, and abilities. Lyric is located in the Castro District of San Francisco. Koshik Roy is the executive director of the Shanti Project. The Shanti Project is a community of volunteers and staff that provides emotional and practical, su practical support to San Francisco's most vulnerable individuals living with life-threatening illnesses in San Francisco. Then we will hear from Mr. Raphael Mandelman. Uh, he is a public law and a affordable housing attorney and serves on the board of trustees for the City College of San Francisco. Uh, reaching, out to in, reaching out to and including all populations, City College strives to provide an affordable and unparalleled learning experience in a supportive and caring environment that leads students to successfully complete their goals. Uh, and then finally, at the end, we have Ms. Major, and she is the executive director of the TGI Project. The TG, excuse me, the TGI Justice Project. The TGI Justice Project is a group of transgender people inside and outside of the, prison, of the prison system, creating a united family in the struggle for survival and freedom. This, their work, they work in collaboration with others to forge a culture of resistance and resilience to strengthen transgender people for the fight against imprisonment, police violence, racism, poverty, and societal pressures. They seek to create a world rooted in self-determination, freedom of expression, and gender justice. TGI Justice Project was located in San Francisco and is now located in Oakland. Um, so before I turn it over to the panelists, we, we provided them some, some questions that we wanted them to, to address for opening remarks on, and I just want to bring the audience in. Um, the, what, the, what we hope the panelists will address is, from you and your organization's viewpoint, can you describe the issue of rising rents for commercial space and how it impacts nonprofits? How do nonprofits leaving San Francisco impact the LGBT community? And how can government, nonprofit community, and activists address this issue? Is it policy, solution, policy solutions? Is it collaborative approaches? Is it fundraising issues? And with that, I'll turn it over to the Grant. Grant. Hi, everyone, and thank you for having me here today. Um, I am the program director at Housing Equality Law Project. We are a fair housing nonprofit that was established in 2009 in San Francisco. Uh, we provide, um, I guess, services that are in addition to what the HRC already provides, and that we uh, do a lot of testing for discrimination, a lot of in-depth investigation uh, with testing to produce evidence uh, where we can for discrimination. And then we uh, seek to enforce uh, the evidence we find with various departments, with the Department of Housing and Urban Development, the Department of Fair Employment and Housing, the Department of Justice sometimes. Um, and that way we're able to get people who experience discrimination redress out of court, usually, um, which is much cheaper, much faster, much less traumatic for everyone. Um, so that's what we do in a nutshell. Um, we started off um, in an office of an attorney friend who granted us some space temporarily while we looked for full-time space. Um, however, rents were rising fast, uh, our budget was very limited. Um, so while we were looking, we actually had to go to a, um, it's called a virtual office where you share space with a bunch of other uh, nonprofits and startups. And um, that worked out for a year or two, but last year we finally decided we need like a real office, 
all our own that we could not afford it anywhere we looked in the city. And we ended up moving to the south, south city. Um, average rent, I think, in the city is 20, 30, 40, 50 dollars a square foot. We actually found office space for a little more than a dollar a square foot, which just can't be beat, especially for our budget. <laughs> um, so there are problems with that, though. We do feel disconnected from the city, even though we utilize all forms of technology to remain connected. We get good referrals from city government agencies like the HRC, the Mayor's Office on Housing, the Mayor's Office on Disability. Um, we do keep connected. We like to come out and speak to people as much as possible to let you know about our services. Um, but it does present, present a challenge. Uh, just not being on the map physically does, just does something. Sometimes you feel kind of forgotten. Luckily not today, so that's good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we, we've actually been, this last year, really making it work. We have really stabilized as an organization in having our own space and utilizing the internet and telephone, receiving emails, um, our website to get clients the help that they need. So of course that, that does present some problems with um, clients who can't drive. If we do need to meet them in person, we do have to go out into the field more. That's an added expense and takes time away from, from doing other things. Um, um, but we've actually been able to make it work really well. We even have some clients in Los Angeles who found us and weren't getting the help they needed there, and we've been able to get them some good results. Um, as far as, do you want to meet all three? Sure, whatever. Yeah. So the impact on the LGBT community would be just um, very similar to the impact it has on all of our clients. And most of our clients are actually people with disabilities who require reasonable accommodations and reasonable modifications to have an equal opportunity to use their dwelling. Um, this is the area that comes up at least 80%, if not more, of the time uh, under fair housing law with our agency. Um, people with HIV, uh, people of color, people who are immigrants, um, people who are transgender, and low-income people all have um, special needs in addition to their disability that we try to be very sensitive to and get them the, um, get them the resources they need to overcome the discrimination and come out better for it. Um, as far as solutions to possibly bring back uh, or keep nonprofits. Um, because there are so many nonprofits still in the city, it, it hasn't been too bad of an effect. Because people know about us, they call us up, they refer clients to us. Um, I think the problem comes if too many leave. It kind of breaks the network. It will break down referrals. People will, will forget about each other. Or So I'm thinking that any way to prevent any further slippage would be good. Um, I don't know if that would be by direct funding increases, by tax credits, or payroll taxes, withholding taxes, uh, providing non nonprofit nonprofits uh, subsidized rent in some way. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about Lyric because I think a lot of this conversation today is the importance of um, those who are working with the community to be a part of the community not just having our building presence there, but actually being active members of the neighborhoods and communities that we're a part of. So Lyric is a 25-year-old institution uh, building community and inspiring positive social change with LGBTQ youth. We work with youth up to the age of 24, predominantly low-income youth of color. Uh, we're a direct service as well as an advocacy social justice organization working through a queer youth lens. Um, and we prioritize working across communities. So um, we work on not just LGBT issues, but how does LGBT issues intersect with issues of immigration, or we're just discussing an environmental justice project that, that we're working on um, this summer. Um, and our focus is on queer youth uh, around health and wellness, queer and ally youth community building, queer youth economic self-sufficiency, and queer youth leadership. And while we do not specifically um, provide housing, um, uh, it is a central issue for our young people. 
um, uh, along with behavioral health supports and jobs. 35% of our young people are homeless, marginally housed, 79% are unemployed, and 59% uh, percent of our young people have an urgent need for mental health and substance abuse services. And so the same economic climate that has kind of created the barriers to housing um, for individuals is the same kind of environmental um, uh, economic uh, climate um, that is creating um, barriers for our institutions. And it's not just an economic climate, it is uh, the policies and practices of um, our government, um, which we are a part of, that create barriers. And, and I think that's where a lot of the change, um, we get, you know, work on those changes. Um, and like I said, just organizations like Lyric need to be in our neighborhoods, um, members of our community, and accessible to our constituents, um, as I think um, Grant uh, talked so importantly about. Um, Lyric, um, and here's, here's the different story here, is Lyric owns our building. And I want to tell you a little bit about the history of that, because I think it was a strategic um, uh, decision on the part of the youth and adult allies that first formed Lyric um, 25 years ago, that 20 years ago uh, we started um, having conversations with the city about the need for a permanent youth center um, in the Castro, because that's where young people were coming, and how do we make space in this very adult-oriented community for young people? Um, and so uh, um, I'm, I'm going to go down a historical path for some of you. Um, in the uh, Jordan um, Agnos mayoral campaign um, of 1991, we made it, we had conversations with both of the candidates to make a promise that they would commit to investing um, in the establishment of a queer youth um, community center. Uh, in the Castro neighborhood, and we made it a promise of their campaigns so that uh, when the winning candidate uh, won, they would need to do this, right? We can all, oftentimes get candidates to make promises that we can't make uh, seated politicians to make those same um, commitments. So um, Jordan won the campaign. Um, at the time, Pam David, who's now the CEO of, of uh, one of the Haas Foundation, she was heading the mayor's office of I think it was called Community Development at that time, was given the mandate. Um, and we also had a board of supervisors with a lot of um, uh, uh, support from the board of supervisors. Roberta Actenberg, Carol Minton, and Harry Britt were all on the board of supervisors at that time. Are we going down memory lane here, people? <laughs> um, but I think, you know, I want, you know, I wasn't there at that time, but as the executive director now, I want to carry the history of Lyric and the, and the, and the, um, uh, uh, what we've learned about how do we engage in that conversation as a community to ensure that um, uh, our institutions um, that we want to have part of our community, um, that um, become the beloved um, uh, uh, institutions of our community that we put into place. Um, early on, uh, the kind of um, things that will will ensure, and and you know, Lyric pays seven hundred dollars a month on a mortgage that we've almost uh, paid down. Okay, you know, people you know who who want to live in the Castro, you know, I mean, like, you know, it's a it's an old Victorian. We have three three full flats. Um, so yeah, interested to to talk more about that in my three ideas are, um, it's about asset building, of course. Um, I've heard that there's been some conversation about a, a revolving loan fund um, uh, to, to be able to have uh, nonprofits be able to, to have the dollars to buy buildings, and, um, uh, and I still like the idea of a municipal bank, which I think um, can be a part of this asset building. Hi everyone, my name is Kaushik Lloyd, as Zoe mentioned, uh, I'm the EB at Shanti. I'll talk about Shanti's situation in terms of housing for uh, our, our office in a second. Just very briefly, if you're not familiar, Shanti is actually one of the oldest caregiving organizations in San Francisco for people with HIV uh, and cancer. We're in our 39th year this year. We support about 2,000 individuals a year, roughly three quarters of whom identifies as LGBT. Uh, and I want to especially thank uh, the Human Rights Commission and the LGBT Advisory Committee for this topic. I think it is really 
kindly, because as problematic and significant as this issue is today, if we look at the trends in real estate, what we're going to find is it's only going to intensify uh, in the near future. So this is really the time for us to be having these kinds of conversations to try to figure out what, what can be done before things get worse. So um, the reason I, why do I say that real estate trends indicate a worse thing of the problem? Uh, the reason I say that is because, generally speaking, residential rent and construction trends are typically ahead of commercial trends by about a year. So if you look at what the residential trends are now, that's actually a pretty good indicator as to what might be coming up in the near future on the commercial side. And looking at that, to be very candid, is actually quite, uh, it's quite daunting. Uh, just this past quarter, the second quarter of this year, San Francisco led the top 50 US metropolitan areas in average increase in residential rent. Interestingly enough, number two is Oakland, which is where a lot of our profits are going. Uh, and San Jose was also the fifth. So overall, the Greater Bay Area uh, had more than double the national average in terms of increase in residential rate. So if that's where the residential rates are now, that means we probably haven't hit the peak for the commercial side. And that is pretty scary because SF, San Francisco's rates since the last quarter of last year have increased by nearly 30%. And already, we have the tightest office market in the so clearly there's a couple of pretty intuitive ways this is going to especially impact the LGBT community. If we have organizations whose mission is to support or serve the LGBT community physically leave, there will be fewer services to access here. Also, if the, for those organizations that stay here, if they have to spend more of their budget on rent, they're going to have fewer dollars left to provide services. So there'll be fewer services that way as well. But the point I'd also like to highlight is that the impact this trend has on all safety net nonprofits also disproportionately impacts the LGBT community. And in fact, just last month, the Williams Institute at UCLA, they released the results from a project uh, they completed on new patterns of poverty in the lesbian, gay, and bisexual communities. And there were a lot of interesting findings, but I just wanted, if I may, for the sake of brevity, to share one overall finding that they had, which is this. Quote, as poverty rates for nearly all populations increased during the recession, lesbian, gay, and bisexual Americans remained more likely to be poor than heterosexuals. Gender, race, education, and geography all influence poverty rates among lesbian, gay, and bisexual populations. And children of same-sex couples are particularly vulnerable to poverty." Close quote. So this was a national study that was done, but I think we can certainly see these trends being illustrated in San Francisco as well. Some of you may have read in the press recently that uh, there's a biannual study that comes out on homelessness, and it was found that 29% of the people in the city that are experiencing, experiencing homelessness right now do identify as LGBT. So clearly, there is a disproportionate impact on the LGBT community on what this trend does for all nonprofits. And so I guess that really leads up to the, I think, the most interesting and perhaps uh, uh, ambitious part of the conversation is what do you really do? This is the reality. Uh, I was talking to someone earlier, I believe there's a state civil code that actually makes it illegal to have uh, rent control for corporations or corporate rent control. Uh, and because of that, this is the context in which we offer. Now, Shanti, we are actually very lucky. We are in the Project Open Hand building, uh, along with the API Wellness Center. So Project Open Hand, Open Hand of course, is not the business of trying to make a lot of profits on, on their, their tenants. So uh, we only have increases based on the consumer price index. And it's actually a very nice hub. There's API Wellness Center, there's Shanti, there's Open Hand. And I was thinking about it, this really can be the kind of model in terms of what we can possibly do. I think the LGBT Center is doing this a little bit. I know Avilas and Open House uh, recently moved there. But we don't have enough areas. And there has to be some really creative thinking in the private sector, in the public sector, in the for-profit sector, in the nonprofit sector. How do you identify some buildings and try to turn them into some kind of nonprofit hubs? I think it's going to be the only way we can really sustain uh, kind of the legacy of what's here in terms of nonprofits. We really are great area for so many services. And there has to be some kind of creative cooperation uh, to try to make sure that stays. So I'll stop there. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Raphael Mandelman, recently elected to the Board of Trustees City College, recently removed from city authority <laughs> over City College. Uh, I, I was thinking about our you know, my, my designation here and thinking, am I here because they want our buildings? Is that what's going on here? 
<laughs> which is not something to laugh about. But yeah. uh, the other sort of irony is, you know, with, with 85,000 students, and in some ways it's one of our larger not-for-profit uh, institutions serving the 99% um, in, in San Francisco. And into just an interesting um, coincidence, perhaps, that at the same time so many organizations uh, serving the 99% Experiencing struggle and displacement that uh, that city colleges are facing. So that is an aside. Um, one sort of thought that I had in thinking about this panel is that although the problem is um, acute at the moment, um, it's not a new problem. Um, I remember working on, on the oil campaign, uh, one of the losing campaigns, um, uh, more than ten years ago. And, um, and in that campaign, we were spending some of our time thinking about the problems of keep nonprofits in San Francisco, and whether you know we might uh, be proposed, what kinds of proposals we might come up with, whether it's five hundred one c three bonds or other things that would get money to create spaces that would be available to nonprofits. Um, so it's not new, but uh, it is it is particularly alarming now in the same way that gentrification and displacement, residential displacement is not new, but when you know people are, are looking to, uh, for apartments and finding that three bedrooms are going for $6,000 a month, um, you know, there's, there's a problem everywhere. Um, I think more interesting than my role actually as a trustee for this conversation is my role as co-chair of the LGBT Community Center, uh, which is one of the buildings that is kind of an anchor um, for uh, Profit exists, <laughs> where LGBT nonprofit existence along with some of the others that are on this panel. Um, and as I was thinking about this panel, I, I talked to our executive director, Rebecca Rawl, um, who's usually wise about these things. Um, and she also emphasized the cyclical nature of this problem. But even though it's cyclical, and even though you know probably things will get better at some point, in the interim, like with residential displacement, you lose all these people and all this goodness that's in the city now and these programs that work have been lost, have gone somewhere else by the time the tide comes back. Um, and so that, you know, the task of public policy, at least in part, is to try to smooth out some of that, uh, some of that loss. And, um, and we've seen some doing an, an ever poorer job at it. Um, the interest of the, the center is like Lyric in an interesting space because we are, um, we have a bill and um, we would love a $700 a month mortgage. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, Re Rebecca doesn't let me talk about that. Right. The, the center's building is uh, those of you who fall with it, who are through its 10 years of um, existence, that, that building and that building loan has been an ongoing problem for the center and yet still. The fact that there was the foresight to create that space, I think over time, is gonna become ever more valuable to the community. Um, open House is locating there, at least temporarily until their um, building gets, gets built. Agulots is there, and, and the idea is that it's sort of, it can be a hub for nonprofits that want to be there. And particularly at times like these, it's a little bit of a refuge. So that's a good thing. Um, in terms of you know response and what can the community do. Um, I think the first is to push for a public response, right? Um, we have seemingly uh, a relatively disempowered public sector right now. Um, I've been experiencing this acutely around City College, um, but the feeling of disempowerment that so many elected officials have around all of our public bodies um, is, is troubling. Nonetheless, there are public solutions. Um, more money. Um, the provisions of the California Constitution that, that say no, uh, no, is it the Constitution or statute? Civil code. Yeah. Civil code. Um, you know, that's something we could change. Um, so the idea of sort of narrowing in and, give, and giving up, I don't think is, you know, is good. I think we should look at things like commercial rent control, at least for, you know, think about the options for nonprofits. Um, think about more public funding and more a more concentrated effort to get buildings into nonprofit hands and out of the market. Um, and I think as 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 queers and friends of queers, um, we have an obligation to invest in our community. Um, uh, 
Horizons Foundation did a study a few years ago about queer investment in nonprofits. And we're pretty generous people. We're not generous with our own organizations and institutions. And um, if we're going to maintain a queer presence in San Francisco, um, if we're going to continue to serve all facets of our community, then that's something that needs to change. People need to give money to John D. and Lyric and the LGBT Community Center and all of the amazing organizations that are doing um, great work. Um, I guess my uh, last point um, would just be to, to emphasize that the cycles of displacement actually make this harder. Because as there are fewer and fewer, as more and more people who live in the city are people who have to work all the time to earn their $200,000 salaries to, or $300,000 salaries or more to pay for their exorbitant rents, as there are fewer and fewer nonprofit workers who can even afford to find a place to live, not to mention going to a place of employment that can pay its rent, there's sort of a cycle of the entire community changing and losing sort of an essential part of what San Francisco has been. So those of us who are lucky enough to be left are fewer in number, which means we have to work harder. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. We actually have to do it, and there's, I think, an obligation to do it, which is why I think it's so great that this panel is, is happening and that you all care and that people are going to continue to work on these issues. Thank you. Ms. Okay, hello, everybody. Um, I work with TGI Justice Project, which is Ten Gender, Gender Variance, and Intersex Justice Project. Um, we work with girls that are in the prison system, transgender women, and the girls when they get out and out of leave. Uh, one of the hard things for us when they come home is we want to keep them from going back to jail. We want them to stop the feeling that, well, that's home, and out here there, it's like a vacation. You know, because we have to be able to live our lives the way we see them. Uh, one of the things that's been going on that got us to move was not only is the city not helping nonprofits to assist, the funds are not helping. They are doing what they want year by year by year by year. Well, peeps, welcome to SF Liberal Buzz. We're really excited that there's a new initiative to vote on in 2014. We're going to That's right, 2014. The sooner, the sooner the better. The sooner the better. So here's what we've been tweeting lately. Uh, let's, have, let's have a look at that. Uh, let's scroll down. Today's topic on SF Liberal Buzz, we're talking about the Cannabis and Hemp Freedom Act. Uh, and this website to go to to find out more about it is savecannabis.org. First two callers would be from savecannabis.org and they are responsible for the language in some of these uh, in, in this initiative, which is an open language, which means that you can contact them. Just go to the website, savecannabis.org. Uh, 